Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our broadcast. I'm Stan Stovall. Today's topic will be how people with severe, profound disabilities learn. And we're joined in the studio today by clinical nurse consultant Karen Green McCowan of McCowan Consultant. Karen, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Stan. It's just great to be here. Yeah. As regular viewers of our broadcast, you are aware already that we often have a live question and answer session with our guest at periodic intervals during the presentation. This time, however, we're going to open up the phone and fax lines right away, right at the beginning of this program and take those calls as they come in throughout the course of the show. So, if you have a question, there's no need to wait for the official Q&A session to get started. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call, and we'll get right to your question. And Karen, as we do get calls from our audience from around the country, uh, I'll pick the appropriate time. I, I hope I won't interrupt in your presentation, but the right time to get in those questions so we can answer them right away. Sounds good to me. Okay, sounds good. All right, the lines are open right now, so if you'd like to call in your question, all you have to do is dial one 800 953 2233. To fax in your question, then you should dial 1-410-786-0123. Let me give those numbers to you again. If you want to phone in your question, it's 1-800-953-2233. For faxed questions, it's 1-410-786-0123. Now, Karen today is going to talk to us about uh, people with severe and profound disabilities and how we can better work with these kind of people, right? Well, specifically, Stan, how those people learn. For a long time, our systems focus too much on what people cannot do mm -hmm. instead of what they can do. We also have it had a tendency to assess those abilities in ways that are not nearly as effective or accurate as they could be. Right. Sounds like it's going to be a great presentation. Uh, so if you're ready, I'm ready. Then we can get right started. Thanks, Stan. Okay. As you know, uh, many folks who have the term complex medical and physical challenges often, <clears throat> as a group, have problems with movement. Mm -hmm. And some are born with damage to the motor centers of the brain, and some have head injuries during the developing years. And I can remember when I came into the field of developmental disabilities, there were some 200 ways you could have a developmental disability. Mm -hmm. And that was like almost 40 years ago. And in the intervening time, some 400 now different ways that, yeah, it. exactly. Now, a lot of you are probably aware that we can have epilepsy. Uh, some individuals during their childhood acquire progressive neurological diseases or conditions that just get in the way of the developing, developing brain, mm -hmm. which doesn't really mature until adolescence. But uh, I'd like to tell you a story about a young man that I worked with about 20 to 25 years ago who for me was a cardinal point in my career in terms okay. of teaching me a lot about uh, the fact that a person's appearance shouldn't uh, fool you into thinking that nobody's home. Uh, this young man that you see on your screen is a seven and a half year old youngster at the time who at the point this picture was taken weighed only 13 pounds. Seven and a half years old. Seven and a half years old. Mm -hmm. He was born on a boat uh, when his mother was coming from uh, Haiti to Miami and she had something that we call an abruptio placenta yeah. which simply means that the placenta or the afterbirth <laughs> you know separates sure. before the child is born. And the, the thing that, that struck me at the time uh, that I want you to remember is that this youngster looked like any other baby. And his injury happened five minutes before he was born. And seven and a half years later, this is what he looks like. So to put this in perspective, Karen, if the same type of birth had happened in a hospital setting, what you're saying is this young man would not have had the... No, uh, okay. absolutely yeah. not. But... Moreover, I want you to look at what gravity, which is the thing that causes all of our bodies after the age of 30 to mm. begin an avalanche to the floor. <laughs> Wait, not so fast though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going, mm, anyway. So, <clears throat> but, I, but there's some other issues that I want when you look at him. Can you see where his head is relative mm -hmm. to the I see spine? His arched back. The uh, spine I is think. what we call hyperextended, and his knees look like they're on backwards. Exactly. And that's nothing more than what we call, uh, you know, that little deformity of the knees, by the way, is called genuary cravatum. Okay. Don't remember that. <laughs> There's no need. But here's the thing that I learned from this young man. Before you start feeling too sorry for him, he was, in fact, one of the most gifted managers of staff I ever met. Mm -hmm. And his repertoire of a shaping of adult behaviors is crafted from the same repertoire that your kids learned to use with you. Exactly. And if you don't remember the kind of cons that your kids pulled on you, usually they involve large doses of guilt. <laughs> but frankly, Henry didn't want to be in any other position other than on the left side that you see him on now. And if you had the gall to put him in any other position, 
you would not be allowed to forget it for like three days. Okay, and this was strictly from a comfort level for Henry. Exactly More right. More comfortable on the left but side. He had no real functional way of communicating. And as a result of this, gravity began shaping that little body into the form that you see here. Now, gravity basically, uh, you know, as I said, causes our bodies to reshape, but right. mostly it's our soft tissue that moves toward the floor. In this case, he's laying down. Mm -hmm. So 2.2 pounds of pressure is pressing down on this little guy for every square inch of body surface exposed to the vertical plane. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that was happening is that all of his, uh, his lungs have changed shape, everything that was going on. But if I put you in a position where your head was too far back mm -hmm. and you accidentally got excited and food came up, you'd aspirate, which is what he was doing all of the time. So in addition to having uh, only two of five lobes functioning, he was also losing about 2% of his body weight a month. And that's how he got to be only 13 pounds at seven and a half years. When we got him, he was in desperate trouble. Incredible. But until we could get him not to con staff. Now, the other thing that was happening with him is that he would go from a fever, uh, from a temperature of about 98 degrees mm -hmm. up to 103 to 104 in a skinny little minute. Right. And uh, within a few hours after that, he would start vomiting. And that was, you know, when he started aspirating. Mm -hmm. At that point, I was part of a special court order team that was designated to go in. And uh, in his facility, there were about 500 people with gastrostomy tubes, Incredible. which at that point was more than all of the other facilities in the United States mm -hmm. combined. And the federal judge says, no, no, we're not going to do this. And he said, first of all, we're going to close this facility. And secondly, these people are all moving out in the community. Mm -hmm. So our team was supposed to come in and assess all of these folks. And we knew, frankly, that Henry was not going to make it across the street if we didn't do something for him. Right. And so the first thing we had to do was to get him off of that left side and get that head forward. When you have your head all the way back like this and you have stuff coming up or going down. Right then it's going to go into your airway. Mm -hmm. So we built a special piece of equipment for him to get him belly down, okay. to get gravity to start working on bringing that head forward. He did not like it. And was it painful also? Um, it was probably a little bit uncomfortable. uncomfortable. But the last time you did 120 sit-ups, were you comfortable? No. <laughs> okay. No, I wasn't. Trust so me. So the issue <laughs> was a choice between comfort for him and whether or not he was going to be alive I three see. months from then. So. It took us a while, by the way. This kid conned everybody. It took us a while to recognize how much power he had over the staff mm -hmm. and how much control he exerted. So we built him a neat piece of equipment, and I'm going to show you a picture of that later on. <clears throat> now, the problem, of course, was the staff said, Henry does not like it. So we said, okay, staff, I'm going to have you sit here. I'm going to give you a little piece of paper, and on the paper it says, Henry is crying profoundly pitifully, right. you know, severely pitifully, moderately pitifully, mildly pitifully. Your job is every 60 seconds you check which one. Mm -hmm. And our mission was to keep the staff so busy that they left their hands off of Henry. Incredible. It took two weeks. Well, three days later, by the way, he decided there was no point in playing to an empty house, so he just kind of kvetched around, you know, like this. But within two weeks, that head came forward. It was fixed in the position that you see here, mm -hmm. fixed there. In two weeks, it came forward to the neutral position, which is the position that you and I swallow safely in. Okay. And uh, we also managed to see that back flatten out. If you look real carefully, that back is really arched. Right, right. And he, uh, we, we had a lot of work to do with him. But what we learned from this is that if you don't get to the core issue in a person's life. Mm -hmm. Now, he was able to go from 13 to 23 pounds in about three months. And wow. if you take your little calculator, you'll quickly figure out that that's about a 60% increase in body weight. That's incredible just from straightening yeah. out the alignment of the... Uh, right, and okay. keeping him from aspirating with his head in extension. Yeah. And it's, it, You know, it's, it's hard to believe that all of this damage was caused simply by gravity, which is something, as you said, all of us deal with on an everyday basis. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly not to that extent, though. Yeah. You know, at that age, I guess. Well, see, I, I find it more helpful for people to identify with this if they realize that gravity is a phenomenon that all of us have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Uh, the bodies in the early years in particular is completely reshaped by gravity. I mean, most kids coming in don't have, uh, you know, have the incomplete joints, particularly of the, you know, <clears throat> the extremities. Right. 
Uh, the hips aren't completely finished. Well, everything is soft tissue. Yeah, at that everything age, is right? soft tissue. So easily pliable, and if you left it in a, in yeah. a certain position, yeah. it'll lock right in there. It too. surely yeah. will. Now, the drive to move is very, very strong in young children, and if a baby doesn't have the normal repertoire, they're going to use whatever they've got to move. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of kids use patterns that are available to them, and our bodies do not like it when we don't use them correctly. <clears throat> so that uh, what you see then is a lot of form follows function. Mm -hmm. Now, in, uh, you know, the, the, what I want you to hear also, though, that there's been a lot of changes in our perceptions in the last 50 years. I came into the field in 1965, and the kids that were in the facility that I started in with Down syndrome, and the label for them at that point was mongoloid mm -hmm. idiot. Mm -hmm. And uh, the labels we used for people in those days were moron, imbecile, idiot, and all that kind of thing because we threw those people away. Mm -hmm. And these are the terms that you and I still use probably from time to time to make references to our family when they do things that don't please us. <laughs> but they were genuine clinical labels in the early 60s. Yeah, but we have, we have since learned uh, since the 60s that these people can be very productive. Uh, there is a, a thought process that goes yeah. on and they are not, as you said, to be thrown exactly. away. Uh, so well, I now refer to people with Down syndrome as the college crowd of the DD group. Because there is, uh, first of all, people with Down syndrome don't go into congregate care. They stay home with their families. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're surviving. Uh, you know, when I was in the field in the early 60s, the lifespan for 50% of the people born with Down syndrome was five years. Wow. And the other 50% of those individuals generally did not survive their 20s. Now, that is gone to people going into their 50s and 60s. And we have a lot of other issues that we found with people. Um, so that we know we're making progress yeah. with these kind of things. And, and that's obvious. I mean, what is the difference between what was happening in this country back in the 60s, uh, where they were only living maybe their early 20s, uh, possibly, and now, and when they're living into their 50s and 60s, specifically with Down syndrome? Well, we've had a lot of attitude alterations. Okay. A lot of the changes in our field mm -hmm. uh, came as a result of the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of better ways of dealing with everything. Yeah. And that includes something that we refer to as, have you ever heard the term Mal maladaptive, maladaptive behavior. behavior? Exactly, exactly. Well, it's, it's always proved more functional for me to mm -hmm. consider all behavior adaptive. Okay. And we have better ways of dealing with those behaviors, and we, we are now perceiving those as functional communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as we sometimes say, uh, <clears throat> the changes that we've made in Down syndrome have really basically dealt with the fact that we are not throwing those people away and we're leaving them at home. And uh, so we're, we're realizing that some people choose to communicate in some unique ways. Mm -hmm. Some people have a lot of different ways that they tell us what they don't like. Mm -hmm. So our position is that everybody can learn. And if we don't give them functional ways, they're going to learn the way they or they're going to uh, they're going to adapt to the environment in sure. ways that work for them. Sure, exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. Well, I, I'm glad that we've at least made some progress in those areas, and we we move forward to, uh, to learn that there's something to be gained from everyone out yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess we should go on to our next slide because you yes. have a whole series of slides here. Yes, I do. Uh, we can talk more about this maladaptive well, behavior. Well, before we do, I want you to take a look at um, the uh, creative communication styles we're talking. Remember, we were talking okay. about Henry, mm -hmm. you know, and he used the environment. Here's a picture of old Henry, by the way, about three months later. Okay. And here he is, his little back straight. Go ahead. And here he is with, uh, <clears throat> Are we? do we have Henry up yet? Okay, so he's got a nice little back straight. Mm -hmm. And that's so much of a difference from the first yeah. picture you showed of, of, of Henry. Well, remember when I told you that the head was fixed exactly. in extension? Exactly. It's now up to the neutral position. Okay. The back is straightened out. Mm -hmm. He's weight bearing. He doesn't look thrilled yet. But if you'll remember, Henry had functional communication. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, as we used to say, uh, is the, how's that working for you? <laughs> now, the young man on the right. Mm -hmm had a, another real style. When I first met him, there was a sign on the top of his bed that said, do not touch Orlando unless absolutely necessary. Okay. Okay? Seems like Orlando's functional communication style was to vomit on people. <laughs> now, particularly if they got too close and he was real good at it, I mean, he was, he convinced you that you shouldn't come close and okay. touch him. We learned later that just as he was learning to walk, he had 
hip surgery and somebody lopped off the top of his hip bones. He was going through a growth spurt and because they put him to bed, because he didn't respond well to that surgery, okay. bony spurs grew out of the top oh, of those geez. hips. And every time somebody touched or moved him... Intense pain. Intense pain. So if you were in that position and you couldn't say, like, go away, what he said is, come near me and I'll vomit all over you. There you go. I and might do the same thing way, in the same circumstances, exactly, believe me. Only way of protecting himself sure. from this extreme discomfort. And when these... What, what used to happen is when these self-protective behaviors is, are perceived as maladaptive, that label says that you have funny brain cells. And it says, I have puking brain cells mm -hmm. <laughs> instead mm -hmm. of normal brain cells. And I need to be controlled and contained rather than giving opportunities to grow and learn like other human beings. So he was trying to communicate the pain. Yeah. They couldn't understand the spoken yeah. word and didn't yeah. understand the vomiting was a way of saying, ow, that hurts. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. It took two years, by the way, to get him, to, to work with him, to get him to allow people to touch him. Mm -hmm. He was perceived as medically fragile, and this is a real bum rap as well. And I know a lot of 30 and 40 year olds, and some, you know, some of the folks that you see in a few of the pictures that you're seeing are much older than they look, by the way, because mm -hmm. people who don't bear weight tend to be smaller. But a lot of these folks went straight into some of these chaotic and harmful environments that we had back in the 60s and 70s that the rest of us wouldn't have survived, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. And so what I tell my audience is, when I talk with them, is I say, if you think that that person who was pulled and shoved and nobody ever talked to them is still alive now, how fragile can they possibly be? Yeah. And please appreciate that the majority of these individuals were fed lying flat on their backs. They often had less than five minutes a meal. I remember at the, I worked in a state facility for seven years, and when somebody would come marching through the door with the cart, you had 40 people to feed and 60 minutes to do it with the two staff. Mm -hmm. So we had some really interesting things happening and a lot higher death rate. Mm -hmm. But the people who, some of the folks that you see in my slides came through that era. Okay, real survivors. Yeah. yeah. Being pulled by an arm and a leg onto a gurney and then slapped on a slab and a hose down was standard procedure in facilities up until the 80s. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so if you simply sat and counted the number of minutes of human interaction in any given day, and I did that one time down in a court case down in uh, a very southern state. Mm -hmm. And these were children, and they got two baths, or two, two meals in a bath in eight minutes total for the, all of those things. Just incredible. And so our issue with a lot of folks who are very severely involved is that they don't want to respond to other human beings. So they're, you know... They, they want you to just go away, and yeah. sometimes they set it up to happen. You that know, it way. really sounds uh, medieval. It really does, but we're talking about uh, as early or as just as few years ago years ago as the 1960s. Just a horrible way, yeah. uh, and that yet was a standard practice at the time, wasn't it? Yeah. See, for Stan, Stan, for you and I, that was a few minutes ago. Yeah. yeah. But for some of the really young folks in our audience, that may seem like ancient history, but right. trust me, it was not. Right. Fortunately, today most children with complex complex disabilities are at home. Mm -hmm. And they have brothers and sisters and parents. And, uh, you know, so when we see those individuals as young adults, they're less apathetic, they're less unresponsive than the same adults with same characteristics that would have spent 10, 15, 20 years in a large congregate care setting, where the staff were literally taught that they could not interact with those individuals and you can't get attached. So that most of us who've been around for a few decades can quickly tell the difference between individuals who've had time in a loving family environment and those who've had, you know, three shifts a day of caretakers. Mm -hmm. and now, it seems like there's been a shift also. We talk about the 50s and the 60s. Yeah. Uh, the norm was to institu institutionalize uh, youngsters most of the time. These days we've now learned through education that that personal intervention and interaction is very important to their yeah. development and yeah. oftentimes it's better to do it at home. Sure. Right? Yeah. And in fact, if you take a look at the figures, um, we are now down to literally one-sixth the number of people in state facilities mm -hmm. because children are kept at home. Yeah. Going back to the issue of assessment, we didn't know how to take a look at some of the individuals that you see labeled medically fragile here. And if we take a look at traditional assessment means, mm -hmm you can see how the outcomes get real devastating for people with complex disabilities sure. when we ask the wrong questions and we don't really look at why they can't perform. 
And then it's tough to hold ourselves responsible for failures, and we tend to blame the person with the disability. Right. Many of my contemporaries have found it useful to think about the business of learning in a little different way. Uh, do you remember a little book that came out about, oh, 15 years ago called Everything I, Le I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? Mm -hmm. Or if looking back on your education, you wonder what algebra really had to do with what you're doing right, now. exactly. So I want to, to get something, you know, if you take a look at a person like Henry, you tend to say, this person is disabled. The disability is a problem. The problem needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Now here's where it starts to get really flaky. Special people are needed to fix it. It needs to go to one of those places. One of those special places, right. To get fixed. Yeah. And it can only come out when it is fixed. And therefore, we all of a sudden become the person is the problem. Now, some of my associates, and I've been around for almost 40 years, we talk about something called form versus function. Mm -hmm. Now, I have four adult children, three of whom were sons. They'd all graduated from high school, and one day there was a knock at our front door. And this young, one of our friends' sons, Todd, stood there with a wicked grin on his face. Yeah. And he said, hi, Mrs. McGowan. Do you remember me? And I said, hmm, I'm not sure. Go into the kitchen, open the uh, refrigerator door, and bend over, and I'll bet I'll remember. <laughs> Now, no visiting teenager we ever knew could go without food in our house for more than an hour. Right. And the mode of choice, that is how they did it, yeah. usually it was directly from the fridge into their right. mouth. Assume the position. I'll Assume recognize the position you that way, or right. on the elbows. Yeah. Well, I'll, many a time, now I, I'm sure you don't know what this has to do with what we're talking about, but if I set a goal for John to learn to eat with a spoon, mm -hmm. I'm focusing on the form of the behavior rather than the function of that in the person's life. I see. And the function of eating, no matter how you do it, is to obtain nourishment. Right. So uh, we often hear, hear people's needs described in how uh, the profession generally does the work rather than uh, you know what the outcome ought to be. So we say, this person needs physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And that often results, I mean, most physical therapists, when they see a person like some of the folks you've seen on the slides, to go, they'll look at them, get glazy-eyed, and say, uh, I don't know what to do. Yeah. So we have had to teach our folks to say, you have to figure out what you want from that person. So if you take a look at the function of a physical therapist, the issue is movement. Right. And the form is sometimes having a physical therapist do that, but not always. Gotcha. So, you know, you have to really begin to take a look at, uh, uh, I'm a nurse, for instance, mm -hmm. and we ought, like to say people need nursing care. Okay. Karen, I see we have a, uh, we have a question from yeah. our studio audience. Uh, Hi. Yes, sir, your question, please. I'm not sure I understand. Could you give uh, some more examples, please? Okay. Well, one of the, the, the other ways that you can think about this is people will often say, John needs a group home. And you're stuck in form. What people really need is a home. Mm -hmm. And what the characteristics of that home are, are really defined in terms of what the individual needs. So if I have a youngster like Henry, uh, if he were tw 10 years older and in a wheelchair, I'd say, I've got to have a home that I can get into with a ramp. Right. I've got a bathroom that I can access. And so group home may be one way, but more and more we're getting at doing that in more creative ways. Mm -hmm. So there were a couple of folks in our field by the name of Campbell and Bricker who said the most critical deficiency in typical assessment for folks mm -hmm. is the emphasis on teaching skills of a specific form rather than going after functional behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you can use your own self as an example of that, I think at this stage of my life, I'm not gonna be working on doing a backflip on the balance beam. I'd like right now to be able to go downstairs without tripping. Mm -hmm. So there are th certain things that are functional at a certain stage of your life other than the kind of things okay. that are on the typical continuum. And therefore, that should be the measure of, uh, of yeah. your, not only your diagnosis, but also the treatment and the progress that you're exactly. making along the way, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. So when we begin to look at that, you start to look at some things that people are doing. And uh, <clears throat> so again, looking at those deficiencies of mm -hmm. form versus function is a real important thing to do. And looking at what regular people need 
statements about person's needs are often our own needs. So if you've got individuals who know normal development, if you're into shoe tying, right. now I hate to break it to you, how many pairs of shoes with strings, you know, do you have? Right. I can't get down there anymore to tie my shoes. I take I the simple route. I wear lots of loafers <laughs> now, you know. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> all of us, regardless of our level of disability, yeah. shame, you know, share some of the same basic needs. And, I, and as I age, which is happening to me rapidly, I see a lot of more comparisons between myself and people who yeah, don't move. All of us, believe me. So people need homes. People need somebody in li their lives who care about them. Mm -hmm. People need access to, you know, a number of environments to learn in. Right. And so if you start looking at people with complex disabilities of having some of those basic needs mm -hmm. and then looking at what's getting in the way of getting those needs met. So our description of disabilities are only relevant to the extent that the person's condition interferes with the fulfillment of the needs that other everybody has. Exactly. And so what folks with disabilities do not have in common with other folks is the independent ability to meet those needs. And in most situations, that's where our help comes. Mm -hmm. For instance, let's talk about communication. Okay. Okay. Um, if you're using the traditional way, you'd say Sally needs speech therapy. Right. Function says Sally needs to communicate in ways that uh, people in her life oh, okay. can understand yeah. her. My friend Henry, for instance, couldn't say, look, when you put me on my tummy or you put me on my, I can't breathe. Okay. So stop it already. Okay. All right. L let me see if I understand this correctly, the, uh, the implications of what you're trying to tell me, Karen. If a person has uh, a diagnosis, for example, of a spastic uh, quadriplegia, for example, uh, are, what you're saying is that that needs to be treated as a functional diagnosis? Did I get that correct? Well, let, let me give you a really okay. wonderful example. <clears throat> Our traditional assessment has a rich history of focusing on what people can't do, but let's just take the term spastic quadriplegia. Okay. Pretend you're going, that you're in World War II and you're going after submarines. Okay. You're out there with your anti-submarine boat and you are going to shoot every periscope you see. Mm -hmm. The problem is spastic quadriplegia says it's about all about my arms and legs. But the real issue with people with that diagnosis, if it's correct even, is that it's what their head is doing in relationship to their body okay. that tells us what the, uh, the hands and or arms and legs are going to do. And so what you're going to end up doing is saying, this person can't do this. And so we focus on the negatives. Now, I'm, I'm in my early 60s. Mm -hmm. I won't tell you, but uh, I'll be 63 on Monday. Okay. Excellent. Happy birthday. Early and as birthday, I say, right? I can't do a back flip on, uh, flip on a balance yep. beam. whoop de hoo Who cares? I'll also never be able to paint the Mona Lisa. But it, this focus tends to, to, you know, hide the fact that I've got a lot of skills left. Sure. And I've got a lot of things I intend to do in my life. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got a, an individual who's trying to learn to tie their shoes, for instance. When there are a lot of other options, like we talked about, like slip-on shoes sure. and Velcro and, uh, you know, but if you're into this, this developmental stage stuff, yeah. not being able to tie your shoes gets translated into some assumptions about what, it, what your developmental age is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My comparison that I heard, used to hear from a very famous person in our business was, why can't a five-year-old drive a car? Mm -hmm. And the answer is because they can't see over the steering wheel. <laughs> it isn't that they don't have the motor skills. Okay. But if you put the label, this person is a five-year-old on somebody, then all of a sudden you become devalued. Exactly. So. It seems to me that some of these tasks that we, uh, we teach in, in the developmental sequence uh, necessary to do uh, whatever it is they want to do uh, oftentimes leads to more even complex behavior. Um, it's almost like confusing the situ situation yeah. for them even more. Yeah. Well, the fact is that if you, for instance, make shoe tying, you could spend 20 years working on shoe tying and if your hands there. wouldn't work. Exactly. If I don't have to worry about shoe tying and you just let me go on and get on to something that's more important, like having relationships with other people, learning to communicate functionally, learning to be able to interact out in the same environments, mm -hmm. like the grocery store, the you know any other place everybody else does, and behave myself so I don't get thrown out on my right. ear, then if we're not careful, we're going to start eradicating functional behavior. So if I tell Henry that it's not okay to cry to get people to do stuff without giving him something better, right. then I'm eradicating functional behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I'd like you to look at the two people on the screen that you see right now. 
um, the lady on the right is particularly uh, fascinating. She's, she's in her mid to late 20s. Mm -hmm. And when she was probably 10 or 12 years old, somebody, she had a pattern like this with her legs <laughs> together. Okay. And the fashion back in, in probably the early 80s was to go in and, and do a little surgery that allowed those legs to relax and okay. fall apart. But she was then sent back to the facility and nobody touched her. So now what you see is the left foot on the right side, the right foot on the left side, and hit two hips that won't bend. Okay. So the fact is she looks pretty weird, but when we actually got her into a position where she could function, she had incredible oral motor skills. Oh, really? She was charming. She was, I mean, she was, she was absolutely seductive mm -hmm. in the nicest way. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean by that? She, sure. I mean, you could hardly stay away from her. Right. Now... When you, if you look at her and you see a person who's really funny, you're going to miss all of those incredible skills. And we see that in a lot of folks. That mm -hmm. is, they have, you know, real patchy skills. Yeah. Because a lot of this iatrogenic, now the term iatrogenic retardation means that it was caused by the treatment. So the, the deformity pattern you see was caused because of not treating her after she had surgery. Mm -hmm. And so we have an even more debilitating deformity than what we started with. And so I want to just briefly take you through about 18 areas of functional analysis that allow us to find some of these incredible behaviors okay. that we see in people that are critical to the more complex behaviors we expect out of folks. Okay. And you're going to find this really helpful. This, again, was developed by, uh, a, you know, a, a, a husband and wife duo by the name of Pip Campbell and Bill Brecker. And they took a look at the underlying functions that were critical to the performance of more uh, complex behavior and useful in, al in analyzing why you couldn't learn. Mm -hmm. Now, I used to take people when they were um, <clears throat> trying to get them to understand what this is all about, and we'd tie them down. And then we'd, uh, you know, tie them off in this way and get the head over to one side, and then we'd give them some food. Say, how's swallowing for you now? <laughs> So that's the kind of stuff we're looking for. It's, first of all, let's go to the first one, which has to do with something that we call thriving. Okay. It's very, very difficult to do anything well when you're ill. Mm -hmm. And many of the people that we work with have very chronic health conditions. For instance, um, I don't know if you're old enough to take a lot of drugs yet. <laughs> No, not, not yet. That's well, coming. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> you know, the little older... Arthritis, <laughs> little tendonitis <laughs> little here and there. But, right. uh, yeah. Your body's going to start telling you soon yeah. how it's going to get you when you're old. But of the 10 most dangerous drugs in our whole, mm -hmm. uh, you know, repertoire of right. hundreds and hundreds of medications, people with developmental disabilities regularly receive seven of them. Seven, seven of drugs. the most dangerous drugs. Incredible. So one of the things I teach folks... Uh, to ask when they're doing assessments is, you know, get it to be a broken record. Mm -hmm. And what you just simply say is, what's it going to take to get this person off of some of these drugs? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised at the answer, yeah. how often we're getting. Now, I want to go back to our, our little person here on the left. Now, can you take a look at Sharon here, who is having the problem with the uh, left foot on the right and okay. the right foot on mm -hmm. the left? I want you to just imagine the GI tract. It starts at the top and ends at the bottom, right? Right. It's 22 feet. 22 feet that sometimes can be tr tough to get through. Oh, sure. Now, it, the stomach, for instance, is a little bag that kind of hangs by one end and then moves around on the other. Mm -hmm. And so it's tough for that food to get through that chain from the inlet to the outlet if her body is in that position. Okay. okay. And if you take any person and lay them on their back after they've had a meal, pretty soon stuff's going to start to come up. You get that reflux movement there. And as we stop moving and as we age, the same thing happens to us. I see. So hiatal hernia is when part of your stomach moves up. Mm -hmm. Gastro, you know, all of the ads sure. about stuff for sure. heartburn. Exactly. That's what happens increasingly as you get over 30 and happens at high frequency to, the, to these folks. So uh, have you ever heard the expression... Whenever I feel the urge to move, I lay down until it passes. I have heard that. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, I find myself uh, often doing that when I take naps. <laughs> well, 
that tends as we age to get uh, into the same kind of lack of movement. But people with the most profound disabilities have neurological impediments to movement. And by that mean they have, I mean they have damage to the motor centers of the brain and they get stuck in patterns that are functional but need to be replaced with more functional movement as the brain develops. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the result is less movement. And here on this particular second area after thriving is we're asking how much does the person move? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, more importantly, it impedes the quality of movement. So second question is, how well does the person move? Um, <clears throat> now, let's take a look at, at quality of movement. Okay, and, and while we're talking about the, yeah. the, the importance of movement and what have you, you know, folks at home uh, and, and watching should keep in mind, this also applies to people who don't have severe uh, disabilities as well. If you stop the movement, you stop function, yeah, exactly. correct? exactly, exactly. Okay. If right. I took you for 24 to 40 hours and put you where you couldn't move, you'd probably Would get uh, have pneumonia yeah. 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 in a short period of time. Yeah. So <clears throat> when we take a look at the quality of movement, mm -hmm. A lot of these abnormal patterns that early kids that kids use when sure. they don't have good movement is responsible for the shape of their body as they get older. Okay. And so the joints. And let me give you an example. Uh, babies learn to take weight on their hands. Right. When you get up on their hands and knees, they're directly working on finishing off the joints of the wrist, the elbow, and the shoulder. When they start subconsciously, going, of course. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. Right. But if they don't do it, this is what we. Oh, that's right. Happen. That's right. Okay. If they don't get you up on I, their I, hips, I, I, yeah. I have seen incidents where, where a baby never raised himself up, and what they did, these arms came out here, and they laid, and they raised their head like that. Yeah, right? exactly. Okay. Same thing happens if a kid does not get up on their hips. The hip sockets are very shallow, and as the baby gets up and starts to walk, they go boom, 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 boom. Form follows function. Mm -hmm and shape follows how you use your body. Okay. And so when we allow people to use their bodies in ways other than what nature intended, we get, we're gonna get some really interesting shapes. Mm -hmm. And by and large, all of these really strange bodies that you see were shaped that way. Okay, let me interrupt you right there okay. because we have another question from the audience. Yes, ma'am, your question, please. Do, what, what are some of the inherent problems uh, in moving any way that you can? Isn't any movement better than none at all? You're, you're absolutely correct. And that's what we tell people. Bad movement is better than no movement. But you're going to pay a price for that as you get older. Mm -hmm. So that uh, when we're focusing on people using abnormal patterns early on, we used to say, oh, the poor little thing. They're not going to move for long, so let's let them do whatever they want to. And then we started seeing the consequences of that abnormal movement. Mm -hmm. Babies born with hemiplegia, with, with uh, involvement on one side of the body, used to be allowed to let that go back like this and overuse the other side. Mm -hmm. And the longer they did that, the more involvement and increased tone they had on one side of the body. And then after they finished off that side, then they got increased tone. So when I see adults who were hemiplegic at birth, I can almost see exactly how that pattern developed. Okay. So if you're going to say any movement is better than no movement, bad movement is better than no movement at all, but the focus on working with people with complex disabilities is to get the best quality of movement that you can. And so that's why we have to assess, A, how they're moving, how well are they moving, and how much are they moving, because you've got a lot of, of issues around that in terms of getting those So is to... the key in the movement area uh, pain? Is, is the pain the central thing as far as what type and how much? Uh, or is some pain for the sake of movement itself, which can be healthy, uh, is that a good thing in some, at some time? You know, that's a huge issue. A lot of folks think that when a child protests or an adult protests, it's because you're hurting them. Right. And a lot of times, it can be something that I refer to as retarded room service. Okay, meaning? Why should I do it if I can get you to do it for me? Okay, all right. The same thing your adolescence will do to you if you're not careful. Okay. I hope that answered your question with regard to the, the amount of movement because you can, I can tell you in it from an empty wheelchair exactly how a person was moving because, for instance, if an individual who has problems, if they move their head, will lock themselves down and they'll use one foot mm -hmm. to push 
and pretty soon you'll see wearing down on the edge of the chair. So you can look at an empty wheelchair and take a look at how the person right. moved. Right. Incredibly, rather than getting well stabilized in that wheelchair and being able to use the hands together, you know, there's sure. all sorts of really sure. fun issues. Sure. Mostly it's physical and occupational therapists who look at these two areas. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're looking at helping people have both good quality movement and lots of it. Okay. 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 How about in the area of, let's say, for example, oral motor uh, function? Well, that's the area. Because that's, that's key to yeah. survival. Oh, if yes you're, it if is. you're not moving the mouth, yes, chances are you okay. And the that's another area where the whole system develops. Mm -hmm. The oral motor eating. In this area, we're looking at how the person uses their lips, their jaw, and their cheeks in it's what we call the three exactly. stages. Yep. You grab it, you pull it in, you move it to the back of the mouth, and you swallow exactly. it down. Now, if you've never had the opportunity to use those structures in a good position, mm -hmm. they don't get finished. Now, the other thing that happens is that, that the individual suddenly, if they've got their head back and their head off to one side, right those structures are going to change shape so they can't use them correctly. Once they sh change shape through, how shall I say this, uh, through exercise, whatever, can you get your, the ideal shape back through exercise or is once it's there, it's too late? You can, you can often get the function back. Okay. All right. I teach or, a lot or of real... at least some measure of it to <laughs> the point where it's yeah. now functional. Yeah. Okay. I used to teach folks, I, it, the best thing to have had as an experience is regular kids. And I'd like to remind people that, you know, remember what your 10-year-old you know, did to you in the grocery store mm -hmm. to embarrass you after they did this. <laughs> then they go and they do this, what I call lip flipping. Yeah, right. See, but normal infants develop those lips by having at them all the time. Mm -hmm. It's when they, you know, when they're, everything is on the, the refrigerator door on, you know, everything is, is sticky. They practice a lot. They put everything yeah. in their mm -hmm. mouth. And, yeah, right, exactly. but that's very functional. Yeah. Now, if I have an individual, and I have a picture of a, a man here who's about 40 years of old, age by mm -hmm. the name of JJ. Okay. Okay, he's 40 years old. He had a number of oral motor issues when we met him. And uh, at this point, he's about 40. <clears throat> he was a very functional man in his early days. But he had a lot of abnormal tone and his jaw retracted and he couldn't use his tongue very well so he started aspirating okay. on a regular basis. He could not get his lips together gotcha. because that literally changed shape as he did this. Sure. The upper lip pulled back, mm -hmm. the tongue could not come forward. Just try sometime drinking out of that little cup of yours there without closing your lips around it. Oh, that, that would be tough. It'd or be sw or yeah. swallowing anything without yeah. closing your lips. So what he did is he adapted to that, but he had stuff trickling in. And uh, we met him when we were doing a project in one of the, uh, the facilities in the state we were working in uh, where a federal judge had ordered us to get uh, these people back to eating by mm -hmm. mouth. Mm -hmm. And the doctor said, no, you can't do JJ. <clears throat> so JJ kind of rolled over beside me as I was working with another person, and he says to me, eat please. And he begged to be included in this, and it was only uh, two days before we left the facility. Okay. The physician said to me, when are you going to feed JJ? Yeah. Now, was this something new, his verbalizing this, this, this need? He's a very talented man. Okay. Again, I want you to look at this guy, and I want you to see that he has a label of profound retardation, mm -hmm. and he is probably only situationally retarded. He okay. is cognitively intact, this guy. Okay. So just, it's real important not to make any assumptions. Right, right. So let's move on to another one. We we'll probably talk a little bit more about eating. Mobility was a big issue for him. And we're here, we're looking at how people get from one place and one position to another. This mm -hmm. young man that you see in the, the, the wheelchair with all the flags, mm -hmm. okay? Um, here, here's an individual that has absolutely no functional movement, but he could move his head forward he could move his head slightly to the right or left. Mm -hmm. So they built him a piece of equipment that simply brought a little charger up that he could use with a head stylus. And I'm not sure how well you can see that. So he could move about his environment outside and the flags so he didn't get hit by a car coming okay. through him. Okay. So, um, so we're simply asking, how does that person get from one position to another? Some people roll. Mm -hmm. Some people bunny hop, which we don't like because it really does bad things to their hips. Right but some people don't get around at all, except uh, when other people push them. And so we start to take a look at that. Now, the other issue is the quality of movement. 
some individuals experience uncontrolled movements each time they move their heads. And I want to show you a couple of those because it's real hard for you to take a look at how much okay. this can get in their way. If I'm stuck in one of those early motor patterns right. and I turn my head this way, this is what happened. Now, th imagine trying to feed yourself if every time position. you turn over. So also what happens is that your arm rolls out and your hand opens. The plate is here. Okay. Now, most of the time, these fellows have trained up the staff if they put a little piece of dysum, which is a blue sticky mm -hmm. thing, and then a little plate. So here's the person also, when they move over this way, the jaw deviates off and the tongue gotcha. goes with it. Don't I look attractive when these <laughs> positions? Okay, uh, off she goes. So the person, when they move their head, you see, to the opposite side, this is what happens. Okay. So they're going to spy that thing and catch it on the fly. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. They're using well, they an abnormal, system. primitive pattern, and they're going to make the best out sure. of it. But they're going to pay some consequences because they also learned some time ago if they want to get their hand up there where they can use it, they're going to have to go back like this. I see. Now the jaw is retracted. I see. And then they come forward and clamp on it and scrape it out. Okay. That's how you can use an abnormal pattern to move. And it is very important for us to analyze how that's happening so we can give them a more functional way. Because okay. the more they use this and the longer they use this, the more trouble they're going to be in eventually. So <clears throat> if every time you look up, your body stiffens. Mm -hmm. now, now, you know, I'm going to try to keep my dignity here. If you go up like this and you do this because that's a pattern right here's one of the things you learn to do now your head goes this way this way this way you trap your head with your shoulders okay and so I can turn my eyes this way and this way and this way and this way but nothing else happens so people with cerebral palsy the term cerebral palsy uh, it refers to a group for whom uh, you know this pro is a particular sure, problem sure. And I remember one time when I was uh, consulting in a group home someplace, and the guy said to me, you know, the funniest thing, every time, if we scoop the food and bring it up to here, then this guy will bring it to his mouth and take it off, but we can't get him to scoop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what the problem was? Every time he, tr uh, he looked down, he lost it. So the issue was not scooping. The issue was getting him stable enough and sitting position so that he could look down without losing his postural yeah. stability. You know, I, I never would have thought of that. Uh, are there some other examples of how abnormal posture can uh, interfere, with, let's say, your vision, for example? Oh, uh, there's a big correlation between the ability to hear and the ability to see. Now, there's a lot of uh, real high incidence of uh, problems with hearing loss and cerebral palsy all by itself. But if you are over here and your mouth is locked open, then a lot of time you're drooling into your eardrum. Oh, I she worked with a nurse practitioner from Florida who said that for the most involved folks that she evaluated who drooled a lot, she never had seen a normal pair of eardrums. Mm. And, and this would be especially true of, of those persons who are lying down all the time and turn exactly. this way. Okay, exactly. All right. I got you. And if your mouth is locked open, mm -hmm. and your then it becomes dry. And if you're an obligatory, uh, or, your mouth, or your nose is stuffy, have you ever noticed when you've got a cold how hard it is oh, to sure, taste? Sure. It's just, uh, because really taste is limited to sour, sweet, bitter, exactly. and those kind of things. Smell is what really adds the essence. Problems with muscle tone and movement affect all of these things. And we used to have some really fun ways to test for that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you look at sensory status on people with complex disabilities, if you have um, a, a lot of visual difficulties, and you and I can identify with that. We certainly can. <laughs> uh, what I'm telling you is that if you've got the problem that you're locked like this and you can only look this way or this way or this way or this way, visual range is a real issue. If you have a sensory problem called nystagmus, where the eyeball, I remember talking with a teacher in a public school one time, and she wanted somebody to track through an arc. And here was an individual whose eyebrows <laughs> said, that's going to just get you eye closing yeah. because it, it really sure. caused the person a lot of sensory disorientation. Sure. So we said, bring it here and take it away. Bring it here so the per can, person can focus. Um, the other issue has to do with your sense in space and your b ability to feel mm -hmm. things. I had chemotherapy about a year and a half ago, and I'm here to tell you that uh, other than the fun of the process, one of the side effects I ended up with was something called peripheral neuropathy, which we see a lot in people with diabetes. Sure. So my hands and feet are numb. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing that happened to me is I was in the shower and closed my eyes and I fell over. 
because I had lost my 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 sense in space. Okay, your personal gyroscope was yeah, exactly out, out gone. Of kilter there. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. Now I learned to adapt to that, and that's the same thing that people with these kind of neuromotor disabilities mm -hmm. adapt to. I, for instance, plant myself up, up against the wall in the shower okay. so that I can find myself in space sure. with my eyes closed. Sure. But a lot of folks will compensate and. But balance is a very difficult difficult one for somebody who doesn't walk to compensate for. Sure. It's also a sense that tends to deteriorate with age. So as you get older, standing on one foot becomes a little more of a problem. Very difficult. Yeah. 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 So in individuals with damage to the motor centers of the brain, stimulus to the joints and the ability to sense one's position in space and protect oneself, and that's the last of the developmental skills. Mm -hmm. So that if you take a dive on the ice here in Maryland, which we don't have in Atlanta where I live. Yeah. Rub it in, why don't you? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so you're going to fall forward and you're going to go out to catch yourself. Right. Our, some of our folks have splinter skills in that area until they finish them off. They don't have the kind of balance they need. So mm -hmm. we take a look at all of those things. Because once you have one of those, you can learn the rest of them. So if I can ca if I can put you down lying and displace you like this and you catch yourself like that, then I have the c capability of giving you that skill in a number of other planes. Okay, I see. So the next one we're looking at is something we call manipulative, the ability to use your hands. Mm -hmm. Now, developmentally, that comes about <clears throat> when the baby gets up <laughs> off the tummy. Right. Onto the hands, then, then they yeah, they come back and forth, and they are developing that sense. So mm -hmm. when I see people with hands like this, what I show people how to do is to a get the hands open and then get some. Yeah, I had a wonderful physical therapist for Nor from North Georgia that I worked yeah. with. She had a little boy with cerebral palsy in public school who wasn't writing very well, and she so she put him on a piano moving program. Pushing the piano, pushing the piano, mm -hmm. and his handwriting skills in, in, uh, got better in just a couple of yeah. weeks. Let me ask you a quick question, because you said that, that when, for example, limbs are locked into a certain position, and you have to try to teach them the opposite in order to be yeah. functional, I, is that a painful process in itself, teaching them that new way to uh, hold themselves so that they can help themselves? The reason we have some clinical specialists in our field, like uh, the person who works with hands most often mm -hmm. is, a, is a clinician called an occupational therapist. Okay. By and large, we, uh, we want to get those hands in a position where we can get the hands and palms open. Okay. You s after you've been doing this for a while, you start to get pretty sensitive about There's a difference between a, a grunt and a scream. You know the difference, well, right? You know, sure. it, the grunt is like how you feel during sure. a sit-up. A scream is, we don't want to do pain. If we do pain, we'll never do it again. Okay, okay. Because the person will turn off. But grunts are progress. Grunts, grunts <laughs> are, well... Or, or at least uh, let you know something is going on yeah. that you're moving well, in the you right direction. Remember Grandma's Law? Spinach, befo <laughs> spinach before ice cream? Oh, I'd almost forgotten that one. Yes, I do. <laughs> Well, a lot of times we don't have, we've never taught the individual to respond to reinforcement. A, a lot of us mm -hmm. will do, like I'll do anything for ice cream at night. I'll walk an hour and a half mm -hmm. to get my ice cream at night. But if I've never been exposed to potentially reinforcing experiences, that's not going to happen. Gotcha. So if I've never tasted pistachio ice cream, for instance, I'm not going to work for that either. Right. Sounds terrible. But once I've tasted it, it's really quite delightful. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another issue there. If you give it to me 20 times a day, my enthusiasm will probably wane. And the problem we have with a lot of individuals with complex disabilities is that they have never learned to respond or work for reinforcement. Why should they? All I have to do is grunt a couple of times, and you're going to come do it all for me. Yeah. And it's really tough because these folks sometimes will have such limited behavioral or experiential repertoires that they have a lot of trouble. And that's, again, mm -hmm. where I'm talking about re the retarded room service issue. Yeah. I have a friend who talks about learned helplessness, right. the ability for me to just let the world happen to yeah. me. So, so if I think I'm hearing you correctly, people can be taught to work for reinforcement. They can indeed. Okay. They can indeed. And... The, the next area we talk about that happens, and you, you probably don't even uh, 
notice it in your own small children, but it's a real uh, important. It's the ability of the person to use objects to get something else. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to do a lot of work in Canada. I remember being in a group home with, uh, uh, talking, you know, give me, uh, you know, ask me what time the train leaves, I'll tell you how to build a railroad. And so I'm chattering away, and this young man in a wheelchair is sitting right next to me. I had a cup of coffee, and rudely, he did not. Mm -hmm. So he looks at my coffee cup, and he looks at me. He looks at my coffee cup, he looks at me. And I, of course, am yattering away, and okay. I ignore him completely. Okay. So pretty soon, he grabs the tablecloth and <laughs> begins pulling my coffee over to him. Okay. Now, if you didn't really know what you were looking at, you would have missed this very advanced intellectual skill in this young man because he had a label of being profoundly retarded and not having enough brain cells to rub together. I see. So you have to be pretty sensitive mm -hmm. to the kinds of ways that people get things done. Gotcha. There's another intellectual thing that tells us that more is going on with people, and that's a term that you, you, if you, you don't have teenagers yet, do you? Not quite. Not quite. Oh, you have so much fun. <laughs> Compliance. <clears throat> that's a, uh, referred to by some people as a willingness to cooperate. Mm -hmm. Non-compliance is a pretty normal stage of development. You see it in three or four-year-olds. You see it in 10-year-olds. Right. And you see it particularly in 13 to 15-year-olds. I mean, is whatever you want us to do, we'll do the opposite. Right, right. And so one of my cohorts used to talk about something called paradoxical intention. That is, getting someone to do something by telling them not to do it. Isn't that reverse psychology? Yeah, okay, I guess okay. it is. <laughs> we have to put an extra fancy right. name on it. But, uh, the thing is that some people need to be just different about it. But if you don't recognize that in order for you to do the opposite, you have to understand what you want from somebody. Exactly. You don't give them credit for what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a question from the audience. Uh, yes, yes ma'am, your question. Yes. Um, are you saying that the presence of object permanence means that the person's ready to speak? Yes. And I think we're going to get there at some point in time, but I... Uh, also have a friend who is a psychologist in Omaha, which is where I worked for a long period of time, and she was working with a uh, young man, and staff used Coke as a reinforcer for him, and they, when, when he wasn't doing anything, they would put it under his chair. One fine day, he went after it, and they were going, oh, worst thing happened, he was, Nyah. and she said, oh, no. She said, he has object permanence, and that means he now recognizes that the object continues to exist after it has left his you know immediate place sure. and that's when children need to use symbols right, that's when they start to say well mom still exists even though she's not in the room and so i have a symbol for that okay so recognizing the the person's ability to to know that something continues to exist after right, when we no right. longer can see it is a real important cognitive step okay. thank you okay yeah. the next thing that we're doing is something we call social responsiveness mm -hmm. That is, the person's willingness to seek interaction from others. And I want you to think about that. Because for a lot of the people that I worked with who are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, mm -hmm. social interaction was never a positive right. experience for them. As and a result, they're, they're in a shell now. They, they won't yeah. respond to anything yeah. or anybody almost, right? Well, my little friend Orlando that we talked about with a hip issue was a really good example of that. And he was introduced to his new wheelchair, which, of course, he would like to have told us what to do with it. <laughs> but when he was in, this was a challenging piece of equipment that it, it has put him in a position where he, uh, you know, was sitting on his hips, he had his feet on the floor, he had his back erect. Um, he was using the same behavior, by the way, to express his discontent for this piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we learned is if that, uh, <clears throat> if he extended his head before he did it, you just, I used to say to people, now, the last time that you had a case of Montezuma's revenge, <laughs> can you remember what your head was doing just before yeah, you upcheck? Exactly. Well, it always goes into extension. So what we learned to do was gently to place his head down, because if he could not extend his head, he couldn't do that. Because mm -hmm. there were two things that we wanted him to learn. You cannot do without people in your life. Okay. And you're going to do this particular thing. Mm -hmm. That that movement of the head was that a painful process in itself? I don't think so. I mean, so. when you talked earlier about uh, you know locking in uh, as a way of you know functioning, 
Uh, yeah. Sometimes you don't, they don't unlock, do For they? For this young man, <laughs> he had essentially normal movement. Okay. He did okay. not have the same kind of which things, is a which big is advantage. Yeah. what the tragedy of his hip surgery was the fact that he didn't need it. He was a teaching mm -hmm. tool. And so that's a real important thing to keep in mind, is that if you were a person who was devalued 30 years ago, right. your big contribution in life was to train residents in some places, whether you needed it or not. Oh, that's tragic. It really is. But what we learn about folks is that <clears throat> when a person, a lot of the, the abnormal maladaptive behaviors that we mm -hmm. see will come out of people who are in so much pain that they want to be left alone. And so body rocking, if you watch some people who do that, or handshake, there's a lot of really interesting kinds of behavior. And the message is, go away. Mm -hmm. And if you don't go away and leave me alone, I'm going to accelerate and I'm going to make it worth your while to get out of my space. Hmm. So that's not acceptable. So we have to find ways when we intervene to make human beings reinforcing. And okay. that takes a lot of creative team building because uh, lots of times it takes a year or two to, you know, to allow the person to bond to other people. Mm -hmm. Those of us who are, who are, who are not professionals like yourself, uh, we've certainly seen people who, as you mentioned, will do the rocking, the constant rocking thing. Yeah. And I know personally, I interpreted that as something that was an uncontrollable movement. They couldn't stop themselves from doing that. What you're telling me though is that's their way of communicating. Leave me alone? Yeah, I ran into a young woman in a facility down in South Texas about 20 years ago. I'm going to show you what she did. It looked like she was trying to poke her eyes out. Right. Later figured out that she was having a little television because there was nothing going on in her space. If you sit down and you press back on your eyeballs, <laughs> you're going to get a very pretty lights. All kind of colors and yeah, things are going on Yeah, some like these. Yeah, you know? exactly, right. <laughs> And so uh, uh, there are a lot of people who have some interesting repertoires. But I hate to break it to you, but normal people do a lot of really strange things well, when true, nobody's too. looking. It's the difference true. between a lot of us mm -hmm. <laughs> do a lot of funny mm -hmm. things. So it's important to understand that those kind of behaviors usually have communicative intent. That they tell us something, and once you get the message, then what your mission is is to give that person a more functional means of communication. Okay and tell them or, or help them understand how we can do that. So that, that probably among anything we do with people is one of the most important things we can do is to figure out what they're trying to tell us. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're beginning to work on functional communication, there's some signs that tell us that people are ready, like mm -hmm. the, you know, understanding the relationship, understanding that something continues to exist. But if we have people who can, who can model a sequence of movement, right. And if you remember, you know, very young children, if you do patty cake, patty cake, baker's man, mm -hmm. that's really when children are, are telling you if they can take instruction to model that vocal imitation is coming see. quickly behind okay. it. Okay. But we have lots of things that folks can do to do that. All right. And, uh, number, but number lots of different, of different techniques. Uh, well, also lots of different ways that folks can communicate. You don't need, a, you don't need to vocalize. Okay. There's, right, there's technology right. is getting pretty sophisticated. There are ten big things we look at. I'm sounding like more and more like Dr. Phil, aren't I? <laughs> ten. <laughs> Need a little more Texas <laughs> playing there, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> ten top approaches for functional assessment. And let me talk to you about these in terms of importance. Okay. The most important thing for me is to a recognize that no matter how bad the person looks, there's a real person in there. Okay. Regardless of the level of disability, if you don't believe that there's a real valuable human being, you'll never go any further. The young man that you see in the picture right now is a, a guy I worked with down in Arizona. Uh, he's in it, you know, he doesn't look very old, but he's actually in his late 20s to 30s. And he, um, he just was unresponsive. I mean, mm -hmm. we noticed, uh, the therapist and I, that he had a real shallow respiratory pattern. And sure enough, we did some what we call respiratory facilitation to get this youngster, to, young man, to breathe deeper and deeper. Sure, sure. He, his eyes fluttered and he came to. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, you know, aren't there some people out there who are just not really capable of what we'll call uh, active treatment? For example, when you say that someone doesn't uh, answer you or they don't yeah. utter a word, uh, there are a lot of people out here who have a tendency to think, I can't reach that person. They are non-communicative, right? So let me not even try. Well, that may well be, but I can't function as a clinician that way. 
I know that there's somebody home, and when they don't respond, I assume it's my problem. Okay, find another way to communicate. Find another right? way. Try another way, and or not if, but how. And I, if the clinician or the, the professional and or the folks who work with the person assume the responsibility, so when the person can't learn, it's because the program fails mm -hmm. as opposed to the person not being valuable. Uh, you know, uh, we do a lot of evaluating from more than one point of view. I like to call it uh, assessment by messing around. Yeah. So you take a person who, uh, get on the mat and you start, fiddling and let's say what would happen if we did this right. what would happen if we did that and we get some of the most interesting things and responses out of mm -hmm. people so you're trying to discover what the person can't do can do when the rules are changed and particularly when many sets of eyes are looking at that individual mm -hmm. from dis different perspectives yeah. okay. we have another question from the audience Hi. yes may have a question yes i was wondering how do we learn to assess some of these really obvious things um, well First, uh, uh, the biggest suggestion I would give is trust the people on the front line. Trust the folks who spend the most time with the person. If you want to know who knows the person, ask mama. <laughs> I hate to say it that way, but the fact is that most of the folks who run on the front line are getting discounted. People don't recognize what they're doing, you know, how much they know about the individual. I remember one woman that we, that, who had had a traumatic brain injury. They said she was in a coma, and mm -hmm. this relates to what you said as well. And the direct care staff person in the meeting went, you know, like this and this, and, and the guy who was facilitating said, you don't seem to agree with that. And he said, and she said, you know, it's really interesting, but on my shift, she opens her eyes, she puts out her hand to have the thing in. And so he, the facilitator said, I wonder how come that's happening. Well, everybody who was coming at her was coming at her in white coats. Okay. And her experience with her traumatic brain injury was that during the period of time immediately following, sure. all of these people with white coats were stabbing her in the back, stabbing her in the leg, yanking her around, and she says, I know how to fix that. I'm going to play dead. Okay. okay. And that's exactly. So it was a fear factor. It was the a white fear coat factor. set off a fear factor, and she just shut down. Does it for me. <laughs> so it, uh, I have white coat hyper hypertension. Do you really? When I go into the doctor's office, my blood pressure goes up 30 points. You've got to see my kids when it's time for vaccinations, <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> and then the, the next question we asked, by the way, are skills different in one place than they are in others? And go, I'm going to go back to another corollary of Grandma's Law. When Grandma says, he never does that at my house. Mm -hmm. And what you'll, you, what you'll hear when you're talking to folks at the day program as opposed to the residential program, they'll say, John never does that here or John can do all of these things here and not there. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of folks with very complex skills that they will produce in some situations that they will not produce in others. And that's again, can cause a lot of staff conflict. Mm -hmm. It's called, you know, if it weren't for you or all of these kind of little games, but if you'll realize that there's something going on in the one space that is not, that gives the person permission to perform or causes the person to perform mm -hmm. in ways we don't like mm -hmm. in another space. So. It, it's really helpful that we, we set aside the blame when we're talking about and just trying to figure out what does this person really know how to do. Yeah, it, puts, it seems to me it puts a lot of pressure on family members to pick the proper facility, proper treatment, proper care to bring out the most in the individual. Yeah, and it yeah. puts a lot of onus because the, the, the issue between, behind the interdisciplinary process, mm -hmm. which is a big deal in our business, is that the the, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. And so we together have much more knowledge than we do one plus one plus right. one plus one. Right. And that's a really important thing. Now, and, and that's why I want people to remember, just because a person has a label of profound retardation doesn't mean that they can't do you th get you to do things for them that sure. they can learn to do for sure. themselves. And so what I want folks to hear is that uh, I found it really functional uh, and there, I think I have a picture again uh, of a young woman who uh, could essentially do nothing on her back. Okay. And this was a young woman who uh, was in a fire and she got a trach too. Mm -hmm. And so when she sat by herself, she would do this and could do nothing essentially. But the therapist got her onto her hands and knees at one point and she began to weight shift and do all kinds of things. She could move independently. She could sit back on her heels and hold her weight. 
and it was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. next question would be, what supports does the person need to do valued things or access valued environments? Sure. And I'm going back again to this young man who was going around in the little wheelchair with the head control. He can go essentially without help anywhere he wants to go and did in this particular, this was a program up in Massachusetts. Now this man also had a label of profound retardation. Okay. I had another person that I met in a Florida facility who was in a cart, a motorized cart. Mm. Here, all you could see when this guy came around the corner was a set of hairy eyebrows. <laughs> And there was a little finger poking up, and the guy came by and gave us this. Tooled on down the hall and disappeared. He had the most bizarre looking chest you'd ever seen, but somebody discovered him and gave him the means to get around right, independently. Right. So, part of my thing is you know, a lot of people have many more skills than you think they do. Somebody has to discover you. And very often, it's our ability to help the frontline staff and our families to feel valued mm -hmm. at team meetings, for instance. If you take a look at a group of 10 or 12 people together, and there's a psychologist, and there's a couple of therapists, and there's a nurse, and there's a doctor, then there sits the so-called, as they perceive themselves, the lowly parent and the lowly direct care staff. And they feel like they have no value in that system, yeah. when in point of fact, they have all of the best information. Mm -hmm. So part of the process of getting the best out of people with complex needs is to help those folks with all of the good information to feel comfortable about putting I it see. forward. I see. So that uh, <laughs> we, we can come up with a lot of really dumb programs, and we need to uh, be prepared to be told by the family and the frontline staff that the person already knows how to do that. And uh, I'll give you an example from the slide. There, this is a young, a fairly young guy. He was really in his late teens. Uh, but <clears throat> he's on phenobarbital, which is a drug we use to give for seizures. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I've told people when I say, what's it going to take to get this guy off of this right. drug, is that the first thing that happened to him when he came off the phenobarb is that the drooling stopped. His lips started moving and his tongue got back closer, you know, to better shape, and he was able to use his oral motor skills right, in a better right. way. Interesting. Yeah. And notice, though, right here, that if you look where the, th where the clinician has her finger right mm -hmm. to the side, she's giving him a stimulus. And what the normal tongue will do then is move in that direction. Can you see that his tongue sure, is doing that? Sure. He had a normal, normal, normal skill in that area. That was the drug that was getting in the way. Gotcha. So that. It was, uh, almost, it was almost an exercise for the mouth. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, okay. Exactly. But w w remember when I was talking about a lot of splinter skills that people right, have? Right, right. Uh, well, uh, this is a 50-year-old man here that I worked with, again, down in South Florida. And the staff were having all sorts of issues with him. At one point, I had met him about three years before. He had a trach. He had all sorts of problems. He had a gastrostomy tube. Took him back to eating by mouth. Got the trach out. Got him down there. And somewhere along the line, they didn't get him. You know, I can't tell you how important it is not to sit like this. Right, right. So in the first slide, you can see his head going all the way back like this. So I'm, I, in the second shot, that's me getting a, a, you know, a hammer lock on him and getting the th what we call the three-point jaw control. <laughs> I can see this hammer lock here. Uh, yeah, take right. Take a look at this picture uh, you get here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now look at the last picture. That oh. was taken about five seconds later. It oh, suddenly amazing. occurred to me, my God, he can do it himself. And, and always so, could, apparently. Always could. Always could. So, so what was the stimulation you provided there in that five-second window that uh, got him to go from picture one to picture three? Well, actually, by picture two, we'd gotten him up into a good functional sitting position. Okay. So feet on the floor, okay. sitting on the bottom bumps. Posture? Just like you are. Just posture? Weight bearing on his forearms so his head could come up. And then we just pulled back, and he could pull out yeah. independently, yeah. and he had an independent consecutive yeah. swallow. Don't you have to be uh, awfully savvy about normal development in order to be able to do this, to be able to recognize those kind of things? Experience helps, yeah. but that's also the interdisciplinary process helps. That's why having a number of people look at the person, that's what we call messing around. Okay. <laughs> Assessment uh, by sure, messing around. Sure, Yeah, and that's what you do is you get your hands on the person, you get the person on the mat, you start to take a look at how that person controls their environment. Mm -hmm. Everybody controls their physical or their social environment in some way. And when the lady asked the question before, if you're alive and not in a deep coma, 
then you have some way of getting the people in your life to do what you want them to do right. or not what you don't want them to do sure. more likely. And once you figure out how they exercise that control, that's where you start building. Uh, most people have more movement than they get credit for. They have splinters and a lot of folks have lost movement. You have to be prepared, by the way, to feel stupid a lot of the time along okay. the way. I have been okay. outdone, I can't tell you how many times, <laughs> by persons who are supposedly right. profoundly right. handicapped. Right. They're testing you. Yeah, because it's really what we're going after is to identify the developmental obstacles. Okay. If, uh, if we have our friend Orlando with the jag uh, jagged thigh bones, I mean, it took some time, but finally the therapist figured out that if they lifted and transferred him putting weight so that they pulled those away as opposed mm -hmm. to just, you know, he started to trust people again. They also then figured out how to get those uh, little jagged things to round out oh, by I putting see. some pressure into those thigh bones yeah. against the socket they were supposed to be in. Yeah, this little boy finally bonded with a wonderful special ed teacher that he had, you know, that he got to simply adore mm -hmm. in the new setting he went to. And we knew that we were out because after a while he started to vomit when she left. It was just, you sure, know, it would break sure. your heart. The ninth thing that I think that is really important is to find the passionate relationship in the person's life. Everybody has somebody who cares about them mm -hmm. someplace. And we learned that the hard way when we used to move people without considering who right. might, what exactly. kind of bonds they sure. might have, particularly sure. in areas where we told families to go away. Yeah. And then we'd get these really quick deaths. Right. What we found out is that if you don't, if you break those bonds without making some compensation for that in another environment, you're going to have a person who, st who loses the will to live. Okay. So we have to ask the question, the staff will say it often like, Johnny is Mrs. Johnson's baby, mm -hmm. which, we, which is a way we'd prefer them not to say it. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that there's somebody there for whom, and see our folks will usually perform for some person. Okay. There was a wonderful woman uh, that I met that uh, we were trying to get gastrostomy tubes out of people and this person had had their G-tube for two years. Now you know that's a sure, tube directly sure. into the stomach. And we said, he's eating completely by mouth. What? She said, well, only Mrs. So-and-so can get him to drink. And so we said, well, what is it she's doing? She was a tough mama mm -hmm. in terms of the, when you, when sure. you hear the definition sure. tough love. I, understand. Yeah. I came into the field when you weren't allowed to be, get too close tough. to people. Exactly. You know, I, I thought it was probably uh, uh, inadvisable for caretakers to really get too emotionally attached. Uh, maybe have been watching too many movies, uh, you know, uh, yeah. where they really didn't get involved. There was a warehousing, leave them to themselves, lock them in a room, leave them alone, just slide them a meal. Yeah. And you didn't want to get too emotionally close yeah. uh, to the patients. Now just you know that's, it. it's the opposite way to go, isn't it? Try it. Yeah. You cannot be in you this business. You get better results by getting attached, yeah. emotionally involved. Yeah. Right? Well, I've been doing this for almost 40 years, and I'm here to tell you that if, if you are not touched and absolutely blown away by some of these people, there's something wrong with yeah. you. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, I would not give up my passionate attachments right. for anything. Right. You know, the last thing we probably need to talk to you about is the question that we ask about some of the silly things we make people do. I had a little girl who had a pelvis that was all the way up in her rib cage. Um, she couldn't breathe, mm -hmm. and they had her on a hair brushing program, hand over hand. And we used to ask the question, if the person can't do this, will we have to hire someone to do it for him or her? Good point. So the question is, if she can't breathe, <laughs> so the burning question for her was, what is it going to take to get her to have that pelvis out of her rib cage right. 24 hours a day because that was the reason she couldn't perform. And then get away from some of the silly stuff. You give staff on the front line some of these dumb programs, and first of all, they don't, you know, they know they're stupid. Sure. And number two, they don't make a difference in the person's life. So if they know they're stupid, Karen, why do ah, they still do them? Because they don't have courage to say, is this the dumbest thing I ever all saw? Right. They're following orders handed yeah, down from yeah, someone else right. or going through the process. And they that. also feel devalued in the system. Okay. 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 And Another way to get at the same issue, to get at what's really important, is to ask the following question. And, it's, and I've been teaching this for probably about 15 years, and it's something I learned from some Canadian associates of mine who, uh, who at the beginning of the process would say, at what is this person at greatest risk for mm -hmm. if we don't change his or her life? 
And it, uh, let's take our little friend Orlando again as okay. an example. If he was continued to be successful at getting people to stay away, never touch him, never do anything, he was losing weight at an incredible rate sure. because he was using the sure. vomiting to control sure. his environment. Because somebody had to touch him several times in a day. Right. He's probably going to die from nutritional mm. issues rel related to that particular behavior. Yeah. So it's really important to get at what that was all about. Get after him. And then understand that there are some things in life that you really have to do. Right. Um, it also helps to remember that, uh, that for me, uh, I, I used to, I stopped smoking eight years ago. Congratulations. Well, I was also fat. <laughs> fat, smoke, breathing, fat, breathing. So I had to choose one because there was no way I could mm -hmm. do both of those mm -hmm. things. So if you're going to try to do those two things simultaneously, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we think we have to have, for people with disabilities, a program in gross motor and a program in fine motor and a program in this and this and this. And we never go after the central issue in people's lives so we can figure out what it is sure. that keeps them from doing what they need to do. And I like to remind people that uh, when you're doing problem solving, 80% of the problem is figuring out what the problem is. And once you figure out what the problem is, the solution is usually pretty simple. So if weight loss is more important, you'll do that. And then I talk about something I call c creative lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And when people talk about doses of therapy, for instance, I try to say, now I'm going to put you on three half hour periods of diet a week. And I'm going to ask, how much weight are you going to lose? If we talk about therapeutic lifestyles, mm -hmm. I'm going to clean my cupboards out of all of the offending objects. I'm going to increase my interaction. I'm going to, I'm going to do something that is not doses of stuff. It is making what is a real life, the situation where there are no smoking cues. <laughs> you know, sure, sure. Do you hear what I'm saying yes, in terms exactly. of exactly. helping people change their lives? Exactly. And we've been flinging little doses of stuff at folks mm -hmm. as opposed to creating therapeutic lifestyles for people. And so um, I want to talk ab about some other basic guides for helping. Mm -hmm. I used to talk about something we call passing the dead person's test. I bet you can hardly wait to hear this one. Um, <laughs> knowing you, there's probably just a little <laughs> twist of the sarcasm involved. But, uh -huh. uh, if yeah, the dead person can do it, it's not an objective. <laughs> I, so, okay. okay, I'm going to take a person 30 minutes post-mortem. Mm -hmm. They're going to be able to tolerate a sideline position for years. So I get real impatient when I see folks doing, the person will tolerate this and tolerate that because it doesn't involve anything right. active on their part. Exactly. So positioning, per se, is not an objective. It's usually a condition under which something else can happen. Right. So you're not going to eat standing on your head. Mm -hmm. You're probably not going to throw a basketball lying on your back. So when we look at what people can do, we ask, what can this person do in this position? And if we want them to do this, how can they handle the okay. antecedent or the condition under I which see. that will happen? Number two is getting a real life. And the question that we want folks to ask is, what would a person of the same age and sex be doing right now if they didn't have a disability? Sure. I had a, my friend JJ, I think you saw him, the 40-year-old. Um, after we got his tube out, and we did, by the way, get his tube out, I checked up on him about a year later, and he was out with his buddies drinking beer in a bar. That's what 40-year-olds <laughs> do occasionally. Oh, okay, all right. Um, so if we pay close attention to the antecedents, that is, the antecedent, the behavior, and what happens after, we can more often create conditions that are much more sophisticated in terms of the behavioral outcomes we I get. See. And uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if you're sitting down here on the small of your back right. or hanging by your armpits, it's tough to write a dissertation. And the last thing I think I really want people to understand is that well, not the last, but the next to the last thing is about demystifying clinical skills. Mm -hmm. um, I give a lot of stuff away. I teach people how to do a lot of things that traditionally are owned by clinicians. Okay. <clears throat> and I usually say to them, because they get real nervous, and I say, uh, what is the worst thing that could happen if you didn't do this right? If the answer is nothing, 
So if I teach somebody, for instance, to flip lips ahead of mealtime, and the mission is to up the tone in the body and it doesn't get better, right. then why not try it? Sure. And so there are a lot of things that we can delegate to frontline staff because we're going to create a therapeutic lifestyle. We're going to want to have people doing lip flipping ahead of every mealtime. Okay. You're not going to get an occupational therapist to be there all of that time. So you've got to make everyday activities therapeutic. Mm -hmm. I can range the shoulders at bath time. I can have a person abduct the arm instead of yanking it forward, and I can, uh, I can assist that person keeping range. So, it, there, you know, you can take a look at a whole day I see. and figure out, you know, how can we make this so that it, it, it makes this person acquire some functional skills. Okay. And lastly, what you're going to assume is if the program doesn't work, it's not the person's fault. It's your program mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's at fault. And so you do it again. I was raised up in a program, by the way. If we didn't have a progress of about 20 to 30 percent acquisition, yeah. in two weeks we had to rewrite the program. But oftentimes, don't clinicians get so locked in and so uh, straightforward-minded as far as, this is the way it says in the book, this is the way it should be done. If it doesn't work, then there must be something wrong with the patient, as you said. Yeah, well, they, bl they do have a tendency to feel frustrated because a lot of clinicians haven't been trained to work with this group of people. Yeah. But it's, So it becomes easier to blame the person mm -hmm. than to blame mm -hmm. or to say, you know, I, I may need to get some help here. Uh, I wish you people would appreciate the fact that physical and occupational and nurses and physicians and all of those clinicians get no training about mm -hmm. working with these mm -hmm. individuals in their basic preparation. And so we all, those of us who have any skills at all, learned it by the seat of our pants. Sure, sure. And so it's okay to say, I don't know if I know how to help you, but yeah. I sure would like you to give me some information yeah. so I can at least try. Sounds like uh, we've come a long way in the approach when dealing with the uh, developmentally disabled. Yeah. Do you know that in 20, year, 20 or 30 years ago, you know, when you've been around as long as I have, it's hard to remember, but I can remember telling people that of all folks with cerebral palsy, 25% of those individuals will be normal intellectually and 75% will have mental retardation. Mm -hmm. Now we say, of all people with cerebral palsy, about 75% of those people will be normal intellectually and 25% may have some cognitive problems. That's I wonder what the difference is. Yeah, exactly. It's we changed our ways of thinking and our approach. Which is a, a very good thing. Yes, isn't it? it is. Karen, I can't tell you how much we, uh, we, we appreciate and thank you coming and, and filling us again on, uh, on your subject matter. It's been very interesting and very enlightening and, and very educational as well. You gave us a great deal of valuable information. It's my pleasure to be Alrighty. here. Alrighty. And I just want to uh, remind folks as we conclude uh, this program, uh, once again I want to thank uh, Karen for being with us and also remind you that uh, if you want to see this program, you can see it in its entirety because this broadcast will be available for up to one year from this date, all you have to do is go to the website, cms.internetstreaming.com. Again, that's cms.internetstreaming.com. And be sure to join us for our next broadcast. It's scheduled for February 27th when we'll discuss dementia. Thanks for watching. For now, I'm Stan Stovall. Have a great day, everybody.